Well, thank you, Christopher, and good morning, everybody. Great to see such a great number of you here today. Uh, I'm just loading up my presentation. It's just being loaded up on the computer. Unfortunately, we had to walk from Oxford Circus because somebody was on the line at Tottenham Court Road. So, running a little late this morning, but uh, I'm wanting to talk today about the, uh, the possibility that many things are synchronized in the solar system. And the reason why they're synchronized is because there are feedback loops operating throughout the solar system via orbital resonance, which means that all the small differences, the solar variation, the variation in length of day that Nicholas has just been talking about, actually add up to, are additive and add up to the climate change that we see here on Earth. So although um, the IPCC maintains that solar variation has a very small effect on climate change, uh, actually in addition to these other synchronous changes um, like length of day, uh, we, can, we can actually get a force that's strong enough to be making a difference to the Earth's climate. So this is sort of the basis of what we call the uh, solar planetary theory. There we go. So, so, um, so what is the solar planetary theory? Well, it's this idea that the Earth's affected by the whole solar system, <clears throat> not just by a trace gas in our atmosphere that changes from 0.3% to 0.4% of our atmosphere. Um, so on the long term, uh, we're looking at things like long-term changes in the solar wind, which might affect uh, the mass of our atmosphere by b blowing part of it off the top as more is being generated from underneath through volcanic action. Uh, orbital changes, so for instance, the, Earth's sh the shape of the Earth's orbit changes on a 100,000-year cycle, uh, and we get every 100,000 years for the last million or so, we've had these glacial and interglacial uh, cycles. And changes in the Earth's length of day uh, on the long term as well will make a difference. Uh, in the medium term, uh, we've got lunar cycles up to around, identified so far, up to around 1800 years. And uh, these sort of seem to coincide with, with long term um, climate cycles observed in the paleo records. Um, solar variation again, LOD changes again. In the short term, those lunar tidal cycles act on 18.6 year cycles and 74 year cycles in the northern Atlantic. Um, we also have an element of, of what's known as chaos. Personally, I think that chaos really just stands for things that we haven't worked out how they work yet. Uh, because the ultimate idea here is that feedbacks operate between the planets and the sun. And so this is why we get synchronicity in between the motion of the planets and the variation of the sun, which we've identified in various ways, which I'll show a couple of diagrams of in a minute. And there's, there, is, there are very obvious signs on the Earth of, of these cyclic events. So for instance, on the northern shores of uh, Siberia and around Hudson Bay, where the land has been rising after the weight of the glacial ice has been uh, removed from them, uh, after the end of the last ice age. LOD. LOD is the change in the length of day. And uh, the, the, um, these rising beaches have ridges on them that correspond to um, major weather pattern changes every 45 years. And every fourth one, i.e. every 180 years, there's a bigger beach ridge. And there is, there is no good explanation for these purely in terms of Earth's internal changes or changes in trace gases in the atmosphere. It's very likely that they have a celestial origin. And this celestial origin is, is the power of tidal action from the moon. The moon's orbit itself has been shaped over billions of years by uh, the motion of the other nearby planets, particularly Venus and Jupiter, which both within an order of magnitude have the, the same gravitational effect on Earth. So the identified patterns that, that by, identified by people like de Vries and Gleisberg and, and other cycles, they, they match um, these planetary cycles that we have identified with our research. So back in 2008, I came across a really good puzzle, which was that I found that 
Changes in Earth's length of day, which are in blue here, uh, those are the annual average changes, um, match very well the, the green curve, which uh, represents the change of position of the center of mass of the solar system with respect to the solar equatorial plane in the z-axis, i.e. up and down. And I, I wondered, you know, how, how could it be possible that the, the changing positions of, of these planets uh, could be affecting the rate that Earth spins at? Um, the match is, is invitingly good. And so, you know, I had a good think about this. And what I've since discovered is, is that because the large outer gas giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune spend many years at a time either above or below the Earth's plane of orbit, there is actually a, an effect, a, a gyroscopic precessionary effect on the Earth through a sort of quadrupole moment. And this affects the rate that the Earth spins at. So, as Nicholas discussed, the uh, shifting of the, of the uh, oceans of the Earth, either near the, nearer the equator, causes the Earth to slow down. Further away from the equator, the Earth will speed up a little bit. Just like an ice skater throwing, throwing her arms out will slow her down and pulling them in, she'll spin faster. So these things are, are synchronized. The changes in the winds and the tides, the changes in the positions of the planets, uh, and the change in solar variability, because if you look at the dating here, 1840 to 2010, we know that the, the sun was quite strong in the late 1800s, and then it, it dipped uh, around 1900. It got strong again in the middle of the century, in the 1940s, uh, and then we had a, a big solar slowdown in the 1970s. And then, of course, it got strong again at the end of the century. So this, these curves also match solar variability, uh, and indeed, the same is true for the Earth's surface temperature, where we had a fall in the temperature to around 1900, a rise in, to the 40s, a fall to the 70s, and a rise to the end of the century. So this shows that all these things are, are synchronized. Now, we extended this with a, a simple model which uses just uh, the orbits of four planets, which are Venus, Earth, Jupiter, and Uranus. And uh, the, the harmonic resonances acting as modulators on, on that. And we made a simple numerical model, which is in yellow here. The output of the model is in yellow. And you can see that it matches the changes uh, in the blue curve, which is uh, the 10 beryllium isotope, which is used as a proxy for solar activity. Um, you can see that, in fact, the model matches the data quite well over 4,000 years. And that when the um, when you're near the top of the, the curve, uh, you, you get the warm periods, Roman warm period, medieval warm period, the modern warm period at the end. And, and when we're down at the bottom, you get the cold episodes like the Dark Ages and the Little Ice Age. So there clearly is a long-term relationship between uh, solar variability and the, the temperature the, of, of the surface of our planet. So working with the same parameters and the same uh, orbital frequencies, we, we then made a similar model using, using again, the orbital periods of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, and uh, also looking at some lunar uh, variation. And we made a predictive model um, at, the end, uh, the, at the end of last year um, the, in blue, we have our prediction for changes in the Earth's length of day. Uh, and then in the purple, that was the, the actual LOD data <coughs> that we already had up to December last year. And then in green is, is sort of from when we made the prediction. And um, we've seen um, what would happen to our model in relation to the real data. And I think, as you can see, it's, it's actually done pretty well. There's been a small diversion here, another one here, and at the moment there's a, a swing. The, the model is, is too far up here, the, the actual data's down here, but the timings are, are still correct, and we do expect that this, that this green line, the actual data, will rejoin our model in the coming months, and if you visit my website, you can see the updates on this every two months uh, to see how well we do with this model. But again, this shows that it is the, the major planets and their shaping of the moon's orbit over billions of years that are actually um, producing changes in Earth's length of day. 
and those concurrently are producing changes in the way that the tides operate because of the upwelling that's caused by a change in the Earth's length of day. If you slow down the solid Earth, the ocean carries on going at the speed it was and it piles up against Africa or it piles up against South America, which causes an upwelling of deep ocean water, cold water, which then spreads out across the surface as the Earth's gravity pulls the geoid back to its regular shape. So we can see how these might interact with the lunar tides and changing the situation of, of where the water's positioned, whether you're getting a bulge at the equator or towards the poles, thus changing the speed that the Earth's spinning at. And recently, the very, this is very recent work from, uh, from Rick Salvador. I wish he could join us, but he's, he's over in Canada. He can't make it, so I'm, I'm presenting his graphs here. But um, here, here we have in, in blue the, uh, the El Nino index. Um, the, the changes in the um, successive El Ninos and La Ninas swinging up and down. And our model in yellow using, again, these same planetary orbital parameters. And you can see that we've achieved uh, a very good match here. Now, I'm not going to make too many claims for this at the moment because you know, we, we have had to be quite careful about the numbers that we've used and, and, uh, and tweak a couple of parameters. So we're going to carry on developing this work uh, in the hope that we can produce a single model which will show, which will explain all of the solar variation, the changes in Earth's length of day, and these changes in the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, because then we think that if we can have a single model that, that will cover all of those three, then we're showing very strong evidence that indeed uh, changes in the Earth's climate and, and changes in the interannual variability uh, are driven by the entire solar system, uh, not by a trace gas in the atmosphere changing its concentration by 0.1% or so. Okay, so uh, I think there was... Uh, oh, here we are. This is our uh, prediction for solar variation over the coming century. Um, you can see in blue the, the actual um, sunspot numbers uh, or TSI uh, values since 1987 um, through into um, the cycle where we are now, cycle 24, which is considerably smaller than the previous two. And we predict that we're going to get a very deep solar minimum lasting three cycles at least uh, and only a, a fairly shallow recovery um, to, to the middle of the century. Uh, and overall, the amount of input of energy into the Earth's oceans that this is going to produce isn't going to be enough to maintain the ocean heat content. So we do expect to see uh, a downturn in surface temperatures um, becoming more marked by the middle of the 2020s. Um, <coughs> So what this shows us really is, is that the current paradigm which just looks at the Earth and its atmosphere and the oceans uh, in, in isolation from the rest of the solar system in which we're embedded is completely inadequate to understanding climate change. And we really need to um, lift our eyes up above the, those low horizons and look to the, uh, to the open skies and the, the enormity of the uh, system that surrounds us in order to gain a better understanding. Uh, thank you very much indeed.